Welcome to this Biology 6 lecture on cellular respiration. This lecture involves or focuses on how cells make ATP molecules using the energy of glucose sugar. And we've talked quite a bit about ATP up to this point in the semester and how it's the energy source for the proteins in your cells. Uh, let's spend just a couple minutes reviewing what we've already covered about ATP, and then we'll get on to the real subject of, of today's lecture, which is how the cells make ATP from glucose sugar. Okay, so you've seen ATP before. Uh, it's a high energy molecule found inside cells. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. And remember, you don't have to remember the full structure of the ATP molecule, but I do want you to know this part right here. Those are three phosphate ions. First phosphate ion, second phosphate ion, and third phosphate ion. So just, yeah, just know that ATP is adenosine triphosphate and it has a tail of three phosphate ions. Okay, and ATP, remember, is a high energy molecule. And what it's used for or is what it's used by is the proteins in your cells. These little worker dudes here are supposed to be various proteins in your cells, like these guys are supposed to be enzymes, and this is a um, channel protein bringing solutes through the membrane, and this is a receptor protein, for example. Well, many of the proteins inside your cells need energy for them to be able to perform their tasks. Now, not all proteins need energy to do their tasks, but, but many of them do. And so for, for the proteins in your cells that do need energy, ATP is the molecule that supplies them with that energy. Yeah, so think of each ATP molecule as just having a lot of energy in it. It's a high energy molecule. And I sometimes symbolize that by showing a charged up battery. Now, ATP doesn't actually have electrical energy in it the way a battery does, but nevertheless, ATP does have a type of energy in it. And you might remember from some of my last uh, previous lectures on ATP that you can think of the energy as being bottled up by this last phosphate right here. That is, if this last phosphate is pulled off of the ATP molecule, that releases the energy out of the ATP molecule. Matter of fact, I think when I click the button, we will see that. Here it is. There it is, yeah, the phosphate. If that last phosphate is broken out, then the energy comes out of the ATP molecule. And, you know, where does the energy go? Well, some protein is going to use that energy um, as its energy source. Well, when that has happened, when that last phosphate has been broken off, it's no longer an ATP molecule. It's now an ADP molecule. Uh, that stands for adenosine diphosphate. Diphosphate means two phosphates on it. And this other phosphate that was broken off is now just kind of an unattached phosphate floating around, not attached to any other molecules. And that's often written P subscript I. It stands for inorganic phosphate. Inorganic in this sense, in this context means it's not attached to any other uh, organic molecules in the cell. It's just kind of a freely f floating uh, phosphate ion. Yeah, anyway, so um, uh, ATP, when it's used for energy, gets turned into adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and inorganic phosphate, PI. And, you know, at that point, the energy has been let out of the molecule, so now think of ADP as kind of a drained battery. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the same concepts uh, again now. So, yeah, we think of ATP as this high-energy molecule, and cells keep a fairly large supply of ATP molecules in their cytoplasm, you know, so that, so that there's a fair amount of ATP in there for, for the proteins in, in the cell to use. And matter of fact, let's picture that now. All these worker dudes here represent all the proteins inside the cell. And, yeah, so when, when those proteins need energy to perform their task, uh, they just grab the nearest ATP molecule there in the cytoplasm, and they, they pull off that last phosphate, and that gives them the energy they need. But what then you end up with is adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate, and that's like a, you know, a drained battery. So you know, all those proteins inside your cells are constantly using those ATPs for energy. And so those ATPs are constantly disappearing from the cytoplasm. And what's appearing is the uh, ADP and PI as, those, as the proteins use those ATPs. Now, the cell must have some way of recharging its ATP supply. In other words, the cell must have some way of reattaching that phosphate back onto the ADP 
to give the cell an ATP molecule again. Otherwise, the cell would just run out of ATPs, and, and, and then the proteins would not be able to do their jobs anymore for lack of energy, and I guess the cell would just die. Okay, so yeah, I'm saying this, this cell has a way of recharging its ATP supply, and that process, uh, the, the cell recharging its ATP supply, is called cellular respiration. Now, you know from experience in real life that to it takes energy to charge up a dead battery back to a fully charged battery. And so this cellular respiration process needs an energy source. And that energy source is glucose. Cells take in glucose sugar and the cells use the energy in the glucose sugar as the energy source to recharge their ATP supply. In other words, they, they use the energy in the glucose to reattach that phosphate to the ADP to give themselves ATP again. Matter of fact, do I have that uh, here? Yeah, so here are the cells using the energy in glucose to convert those ADPs and PIs back to ATP, which is what the cell wants, right? It wants to maintain a big supply of ATP so to make sure its, its proteins have all the energy that they need. Okay, so that, this is really going to be the focus of today's lecture is how exactly cells get the energy out of glucose um, to recharge their ATP supply. And as it turns out, there are actually two types of cellular respiration. Um, you know, they, they both involve the cell getting energy out of glucose to recharge its ATP supply. But yeah, that being said, there are two types of cell respiration that the cell can do. One type is called cellular aerobic respiration, and the other type is called cellular anaerobic respiration. And again, you know, both of them get the energy out of glucose to recharge the ATP, but nevertheless, they are two different styles of, of, of doing that, of, of, of cellular respiration. Now, we're going to talk about these two processes um, in, in, in depth during this lecture. But just as a preview, the cellular aerobic respiration style of cellular respiration uh, requires that the cell have, have oxygen. So oxygen is required for, for this one. Matter of fact, aerobic means oxygen using. But cellular anaerobic respiration does not require that the cell have any oxygen. The cell, the cell can do this even if there's no oxygen. In fact, the word anaerobic means no oxygen. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off by talking about the cellular aerobic respiration style of cell respiration. Um, why are we going to start off with that one? Well, it's the usual one. Almost all the time your cells are using uh, cellular aerobic respiration to recharge their ATP supply. Only very rarely do your cells use anaerobic, cellular anaerobic respiration to recharge their ATP supply. So yes, let's start off with the cellular aerobic respiration. Okay, we're going to use this diagram to discuss cellular aerobic respiration. And uh, in this diagram, this sort of represents a blood vessel, and the green oval-shaped thing is a cell. And this organelle in the middle of the cell is called a mitochondria organelle. Uh, why are we showing it? Well. It's the organelle where most of the stages of cellular aerobic respiration take place. Uh, not all the stages, but most of the stages um, take place in the mitochondria. Okay, well, so um, for the cell to do cellular aerobic respiration, uh, the cell needs to take in a glucose molecule from the blood. And so here, that is right there. The glucose goes into the cell. Um, and, but to get the energy out of that glucose, you know, to recharge its ATP supply, the cell needs to also take in oxygen molecules from the blood. The cell is going to use those oxygens to break down the glucose into carbon dioxide and water molecules. And that process of the oxygen reacting with the glucose, uh, you know, breaking the glu glucose into CO2 and water, that process releases energy that the cell is able to use to recharge its ATP supply. So let's begin to look at that. Here comes this oxygen like so. And yeah, then the oxygen reacts with the glucose molecule and breaks part of the glucose molecule down into carbon dioxide and water molecules. Uh, let me kind of stop here for a second. And so if you look at the uh, lecture handout for today's lecture, it defines cellular aerobic respiration, a process by which cells obtain energy to recharge their ATP supply by using oxygen to break down glucose. Um, the very term aerobic means oxygen using. Um, yeah, and, and 
this cellular aerobic respiration is the usual way that cells use to, to uh, recharge their ATP supply. Um, now, um, the, the reaction is more complicated than I'm showing it here. I, I made it look like the oxygen just goes in and reacts directly with the glucose molecule. In real life, it's more complicated than that. There are many enzymes involved in the in the process. It's, it's not as simple as I'm showing it here. But nevertheless, con concept-wise, you know, that this is valid. The oxygens do help the cell break down the glucose into carbon dioxide and water. And yeah, and, and every time an oxygen reacts with the glucose, that releases some energy from the glucose and the cell uses that energy um, to recharge some of its ATP supply. Oh, where do those carbon dioxides and water go? They, they just go into the, into the bloodstream. The blood will carry them away. But yes, uh, every time that happens, the cell... Um, get some energy and the cell uses that to uh, recharge some ATPs. But notice that that one oxygen molecule from the blood was not sufficient to break down all of the glucose. And so the cell has to take in more than one oxygen molecule from the blood to fully break down each glucose molecule. And so let's just watch that play out. The oxygens keep coming out of the blood and the glucose is getting more and more broken down into CO2 and water. Um, and more and more ATPs are being produced. But yeah, it takes several oxygens to, to break down one glucose molecule by cellular aerobic respiration. Okay, well, so what you just saw there was cellular aerobic respiration of one glucose molecule. It can be, what you just saw there can be represented by a chemical reaction. And here's what it looks like. The chemical reaction for cellular aerobic respiration, when written out, looks like this one glucose molecule, remember glucose molecular formula C6H12O6, so one glucose molecule reacts with six oxygen molecules. So it took, takes six of those oxygen molecules from the blood to fully break down one glucose molecule. Anyway, each one glucose reacts with six oxygen molecules and it turns into six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules. And for every one glucose that goes through this reaction, the cell is able to get enough energy out of the glucose to recharge 36 of its ATP molecules. Okay, now incidentally, um, if for whatever reason the cell is not able to get enough glucose out of the, out of the blood uh, to recharge its ATP, the cell can use other molecules. The, the cell can use uh, fats and other molecules um, um, instead of glucose to, to, to keep this reaction going. But that being said, by far glucose is the favorite fuel that your cells uh, prefer to use for, for cellular aerobic respiration. All right, well, here we are with this diagram again. So um, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, Cellular aerobic respiration is more complicated than that first cartoon uh, showed. There, there, there are many enzymes involved in, in the reaction. Um, there are actually three major stages of cellular aerobic respiration. Um, the first stage is called glycolysis, and it takes glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm, not in the mitochondria. The, the second stage is called the citric acid cycle, or sometimes called the Krebs cycle. And that, that second stage, the citric acid cycle, takes place in the mitochondria. And the third stage um, is called the electron transport system, and it takes place also in the mitochondria. So three stages, glycolysis in the cytoplasm, and citric acid cycle and electron transport system in the mitochondria. So what we're going to do now is go over those um, three stages of cellular aerobic respiration one at a time, you know, see them in a little bit more detail. So let's zoom in right about here. We're going to zoom in kind of a close-up of this area, the cytoplasm and, and also the, uh, the, uh, the mitochondria there, so we can see those stages a little bit more uh, closely. Okay, yes, here you see the cytoplasm of the cell. Here's the cell's membrane, and here's this mitochondria organelle. All right, yeah, so we're going to look at the three stages of cellular aerobic respiration. And of course, cellular aerobic, aerobic respiration begins with a glucose molecule coming into the cell, right? So here's the glucose coming in, into the cell. Okay, so the, yeah, the three stages are called 
the glycolysis stage, the citric acid cycle stage, and the electron transport system stage. And so we'll, we're going to start with the first one here, the glycolysis stage. Um, if you read in the uh, in the uh, the lecture handout, it says glycolysis is a metabolic pathway. And remember what that means. A metabolic pathway is a series of enzymes. These little arrows represent enzymes there in the cytoplasm. So a, a, a team of a metabolic pathway is a team of enzymes that together are going to uh, cause a big chemical reaction in, in the substrate of the metabolic pathway. And of course, the substrate of, of the glycolysis metabolic pathway is glucose. That's the molecule that goes into the uh, glycolysis metabolic pathway. OK, so yeah, when I click the button, we'll see glucose start to move downward through this glycolysis metabolic pathway. And about halfway through, we're going to see glucose split into two smaller molecules. Now, a quick review question here. How many carbon atoms are in the backbone of glucose? In other words, how many carbon atoms does a glucose molecule have? And the answer is six. You might remember the molecular formula for glucose is C6H12O6. So we, we know that there are six carbon atoms per glucose molecule. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is about halfway through this glycolysis metabolic pathway, the glucose will be split into two three carbon molecules. So matter of fact, let me just show you that here. So here goes glucose through the um, glycolysis metabolic pathway. And yeah, about halfway down, one of those enzymes splits the six carbon glucose molecule into two three carbon molecules. And yeah, that, that's where the term glycolysis comes from. Uh, glyco means sugar and lysis means splitting. So well, it's a perfect description that, that the glucose gets split into two three carbon molecules. Now, when I click the button, those three carbon molecules will continue their, their way on down through the, glyco through the glycolysis pathway. But as they're working their way down, the cell is getting energy out of them. And the cell gets enough energy out of them to recharge two ATPs. And so here we go with that. Each of those molecules uh, produced one ATP. So a grand total of two ATPs is what the cell gains um, from the glucose that went through the, through the uh, glycolysis metabolic pathway. OK. Um, well, so what are the products? What are these two molecules that the cell ended up making? Those are called pyruvate molecules. And that is the end of the glycolysis pathway. Um, the glucose was broken down by these uh, enzymes of the glycolysis pathway into two pyruvate molecules. Um, and just to, to summarize a little bit, uh, the cell was able got enough energy out of the glucose from the glycolysis pathway to recharge two ATPs. In other words, by breaking down the glucose into two pyruvates, the cell got enough energy to recharge uh, two ATPs. Now, before we go on to the next stages, uh, a couple of interesting things about the glycolysis metabolic pathway. One interesting thing is it does not require any oxygen. In other words, all of these enzymes work perfectly fine without any oxygen. They can they can break down glucose into pyruvates and get the two ATPs for the cell, even if there's no oxygen present. And at first you might say, wait a minute, Mr. Edens, you told us that, you know, this is this is cellular aerobic respiration that we're looking at, and you told us aerobic means oxygen requiring. So now you're telling us that no oxygen is required. Well, overall, cellular aerobic respiration does require oxygen, but this glycolysis step is this glycolysis stage is the exception. Remember, there are three stages of cellular aerobic respiration, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and electron transport system. I'm saying this first stage, glycolysis, doesn't require oxygen. But the next two stages, citric acid cycle and electron transport system, do require oxygen. So that's one sort of oddball thing about the glycolysis stage. It's the only stage of the three that doesn't require oxygen. And another oddball thing about the glycolysis stage now that I'm talking about its oddball characteristics, is it's the only one of the three stages that takes that takes place out here in the cytoplasm. The other two stages, the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system, both take place inside the mitochondria. Matter of fact, um, let's now move on to start talking about those uh, those two stages. Okay, so the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system. Uh, both uh, both take place inside the inside the mitochondria. 
And the, the two pyruvates that were made from the glycolysis, those go into the mitochondria. They are going to, most of the glucose, most of the glucose's energy is still inside the uh, pyruvates. Only a small amount of the glucose's energy was used to make these two ATPs. And so these are going to act as the, the energy carrying molecules that go into the uh, mitochondria. Um, and so they're going to provide the energy for the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system to make ATPs. So there they go. They enter the mitochondria, then the citric acid cycle, and then the electron transport system starts using their energy to make ATP. Um, how much ATP? Well, uh, actually, uh, quite a bit of ATP uh, is made. Uh, the grand total from the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system is 34 ATPs. And you know that that's a lot more than just the two that were made in the glycolysis step. So just you know kind of summarizing uh, up to this point, uh, the first step of cellular aerobic respiration, the glycolysis step, only makes a very small number, just two ATPs, whereas the next two steps, the ones that take place in the mitochondria, make the vast majority. They make 34 um, uh, ATPs, you know from each glucose that started the whole process. Uh, yeah, so the grand total is 36 ATPs per glucose that starts cellular aerobic respiration, but only two of those are made uh, by glycolysis. Okay, um, now, uh, I think I mentioned this before, but these two stages, the, the, uh, the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system, oxygen is required for those stages. In other words, um, uh, if, uh, um, if there's not enough oxygen uh, for the cell, those two stages just basically stop. Okay, maybe this would be a good, good spot to uh, summarize a little bit. All right, so uh, cellular, cellular aerobic respiration is where the cell gets energy out of glucose to recharge its ATP supply, and the cell gets the energy out of glucose by uh, using oxygen, O2 molecules, uh, to break down the glucose into carbon dioxide and water. Um, the three stages are uh, glycolysis, citric acid cycle and electron transport system. The glycolysis stage takes place in the cytoplasm, where a citric acid cycle and electron transport system take place inside the mitochondria. Um, when the glucose goes through the, um, oh, sorry, uh, glycolysis is um, unique, in, well, in two ways. It's the only, only stage that takes place in the cytoplasm, and no oxygen is required for the glycolysis stage, but uh, oxygen is required for these two stages here in the mitochondria, citric acid cycle and electron transport system. All right, so, uh, yes, yeah, so um, if the cell is, uh, has low or, or no oxygen available to it, it can't do the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system. Those just essentially shut down. But even if there's low or no oxygen, glycolysis can keep going because, you know, no oxygen is required for that. And so now we're going to explore that. So imagine the cell, uh, for whatever reason, has little or no oxygen available to it. So it can no longer use these to make any ATP. And so I'm just going to kind of fade them out. Now, the, the mitochondria is still there, even under low oxygen conditions. Uh, but since it's not functioning under low oxygen conditions. Let's just make it invisible for a moment. Okay, well, what you now see here in this diagram, where the only process that's making ATP in the cell is the glycolysis pathway, that is the essence of cellular anaerobic respiration. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to fill in some more details about cellular anaerobic respiration in a moment, but what I am saying right now is kind of a preview the main idea behind cellular anaerobic respiration is that when there's little or no oxygen available to the cell, the cell is just running the glycolysis pathway and not those two, um, just running the glycolysis um, stage. It's not running the citric acid cycle or electron transport system because those are the ones that shut down if there's little or no oxygen. Okay, but let me introduce anaerobic respiration uh, properly. So at the beginning of this lecture, we learned that Cellular respiration is where cells recharge their ATP supply with the energy that they get out of glucose sugar. And if the cell uses oxygen to break down the glucose sugar, then we say that that is cellular aerobic respiration, and it, the cell gets 36 ATPs recharged per glucose that goes through cellular aerobic respiration. But if there's little or no oxygen available to the cell, uh, 
the cell can do anaerobic respiration, um, which means that no oxygen is required. Okay, uh, so let's look closer at cellular anaerobic respiration now. All right, so um, yeah, we're, we're talking about conditions where there's little or no oxygen available to the cell, and those are sometimes called anaerobic conditions if there's little or no oxygen. And so the cell has to switch into doing cellular anaerobic respiration. Oh, incidentally, what sort of cells are we talking about? Well, when you think about cells that switch into anaerobic respiration fairly frequently, think of muscle cells. In other words, muscle cells are the main cells in your body that uh, switch from doing aerobic to anaerobic respiration. And I'll talk in a little bit later why it's muscle cells that tend to be doing the anaerobic respiration in your body. Okay, so let's imagine a cell, a muscle cell, and uh, yeah, there's little or no oxygen available to it, and so it still needs to recharge its ATP supply, so it takes in a glucose, and then it essentially just runs the, um, the uh, uh, glycolysis uh, uh, pathway. So, you know, those glycolysis enzymes are going to grab the glucose and, uh, well, you know how it works. The parts way through the pathway gets split into two, three carbon molecules, and from each of those an ATP is generated. So two ATPs are made for the, for the muscle cell. And remember um, that the reason why the glycolysis can run is that no oxygen is required for the glycolysis uh, metabolic pathway to go. Okay, just as a quick review question, when we talked about the glycolysis stage before, what is the name of these um, three carbon molecules that the glucose is broken down into? And the correct answer is pyruvate. Um, here's a difference between glycolysis that we saw before and cellular anaerobic respiration. Under anaerobic conditions, low oxygen conditions, an extra enzyme becomes activated that is not normally part of normal glycolysis when there is oxygen. And so I'm going to change this last enzyme here. Yeah, so this is a, a different enzyme than, than the ones that we saw before in, for glycolysis. And this last enzyme converts the pyruvates into a different three-carbon molecule called lactic acid. So unlike the standard glycolysis that we talked, be, talked about before, which takes place when the cell does have oxygen, uh, the glycolysis or the pathway that takes place under anaerobic conditions, which we just called cellular anaerobic respiration, uh, the, two, the glucose is split into two molecules of lactic acid, not two molecules of, uh, of pyruvate. Okay, um, well, so let's uh, summarize what we've uh, learned so far. In cellular anaerobic respiration, it takes place when the cell uh, has too little oxygen, not enough oxygen to do cellular aerobic respiration, and the uh, metabolic pathway is essentially the same as the glycolysis metabolic pathway, uh, except uh, there's one extra enzyme that gets involved, and so you end up with two molecules of lactic acid, not two molecules of pyruvate. But that being said, just like we saw with the glycolysis pathway, no oxygen is required, and two ATPs are made for each glucose that goes through the uh, cellular, aerobic, uh, cellular anaerobic respiration um, metabolic pathway. All right, so here is the cellular anaerobic respiration written out as a chemical reaction. Uh, each glucose molecule that goes through cellular anaerobic respiration gets broken down into two molecules of lactic acid. C3H6O3 is lactic acid. And for each glucose that goes through this cellular anaerobic respiration process, the cell is able to recharge two ATPs. All right, and so here we are with this view of the cellular anaerobic uh, respiration. Now, um, Cellular, an cellular anaerobic respiration has one huge advantage for uh, the cells. And the advantage is they're still able to make ATP even if there's no oxygen, right? And why is that a huge advantage? Well, picture your muscle cells. Um, if your muscle cells are not able to get enough oxygen from your blood to do aerobic respiration, if they didn't have anaerobic respiration to do, they just wouldn't be able to make any ATP at all. And without ATP, your muscles couldn't contract. And so I'm saying that if, if your muscles couldn't do anaerobic respiration, you would just they would just stop working. You'd be paralyzed uh, anytime your blood got low on oxygen. So yeah, it, it's a huge advantage. It's very important that your muscles can switch into um, 
anaerobic respiration. It allows you to keep doing your activity, your exercise, even if your blood gets low on oxygen. Uh, so that's the main advantage, um, being able to make ATP even if there's no oxygen. But anaerobic respiration has two big disadvantages. Um, the main disadvantage is that it only makes two ATPs per glucose. Whereas if the cell could do aerobic respiration, how many ATPs does it get per glucose? 36, right? And so the, the, the cell gets a much lower ATP yield per glucose if the cell is doing anaerobic respiration. And the significance of that is um, if your muscle cells are doing anaerobic respiration, they're going to run out of glucose quickly, right? So here's your, your muscle cells. And yeah, if it's, if it's doing anaerobic respiration, it's going to burn through its glucose supply very quickly. Think of it Think of it this way. If you had a car that got only two miles per gallon, you would run out of gasoline very quickly, right? Because that's a very inefficient use of your fuel. Well, the same with your muscle cells. If they're doing anaerobic respiration, they tend to burn up their glucose supply very quickly because it's, it's such an inefficient process at only two ATPs uh, um, per glucose. Now, there's actually a second disadvantage also for your muscle cells doing anaerobic respiration, and that second disadvantage is the lactic acid. Remember, when muscles are doing anaerobic respiration, they produce lactic acid molecules as the product. Well, why is that a disadvantage to make lactic acid molecules? The, the answer is that it leads to muscle fatigue. Muscle fatigue is where your muscles um, get tired and, and a burning sensation. And you've probably felt that, you know, if you've tried to walk up a long flight of stairs, maybe your legs start burning, or if you had to hold something heavy for a long time, your arm muscles start burning. That's the lactic acid building up in, inside your muscles, and it um, you know, causes a, a, a uncomfortable burning sensation and a temporary uh, weakness in the muscle. Okay, so that was about cellular anaerobic respiration. But just to review a concept from earlier in this lecture, um, cells are able to do two types of cellular respiration. There's cellular aerobic respiration, where they use oxygen uh, to break down the glucose, and cellular anaerobic respiration, when, where there's not enough oxygen. So it's a way, way of cells uh, have of breaking down glucose uh, without the need for any oxygen. Okay, and um, I think I mentioned earlier that our cells do aerobic respiration most of the time. Think of that as sort of their usual way of, of, of recharging their ATP supply. And I told you that cells only switch over to anaerobic respiration uh, when the oxygen levels in the blood are, are too low for aerobic respiration. But let's fill in some details about those concepts. Like what exactly do I mean when I say that our cells do aerobic respiration most of the time? Like what sort of situations are they doing aerobic respiration in? And likewise, when I say that uh, our cells, especially muscle cells, do anaerobic respiration when there's low oxygen in the blood, let's talk about, well, what might cause low oxygen levels uh, in the blood. Okay, let's do the first part there. What sort of situations um, do, uh, do our cells do the aerobic respiration in? Well, um, I guess I would describe it as anything that's a not a strenuous activity. So when you're resting, maybe sleeping in bed or sitting on the couch or, or sitting somewhere um, or just walking gently or any sort of non-strenuous activity, that's when your body uh, is doing cellular aerobic respiration. And if you think about it, that's what we spend most of our time doing, is doing non-strenuous things. So you might wonder, well, why is it that our cells choose to do aerobic respiration when we're doing you know, standard non-strenuous activities? And the answer is the cells get more ATP per glucose. Remember that when cells are doing aerobic respiration, the cells get 36 ATPs per glucose. But when cells are doing anaerobic respiration, they only get two ATPs per glucose. So it's just more efficient. You know, the cells get more ATPs per glucose if they're doing aerobic respiration. And so that's why aerobic respiration is sort of the standard respiration that your, that your cells do. Uh, just to, to make an analogy about this point, imagine you had two cars. One car got 36 miles to the gallon and the other car got only two miles per gallon. Which would you rather drive? You know, it's a no-brainer. You'd always drive the 36 mile per gallon one because you you get more for your for your gallon of gas, right? Um, okay, yeah. So your your body sort of wants to do 
aerobic respiration because it, it, it's more efficient. It gets more ATPs per glucose. Um, cellular anaerobic respiration is only used when the oxygen levels in your blood are too low for aerobic respiration. And you might say, well, you know, what sort of situation is that? Like if, if you're choking on something? No, I mean, usually uh, what causes low levels of, of oxygen in the blood, you know, um, so that your cells have to do anaerobic, what usually causes that is um, an intense burst of exercise, uh, but done for a short enough time so that you're not, you're not breathing hard. And let me give you an example. So let's say I'm sitting around the house on the weekend and my wife says, hey, lift up the couch. I want to vacuum clean underneath it. So I grab hold of the couch and oh, the couch is kind of heavy, but I lift it up, right? So that's, I would describe that as uh, an, a short burst of intense exercise, right? I'm, I'm not going to be holding the couch for, couch for too long and it, it's, um, it's, short, it's short enough so I don't end up breathing hard. I keep my normal um, breathing rate, right? But it's still a, a very intense exercise even so. Um, so I think you would agree that when I'm doing that, you know, lifting up the couch for that short time, my muscles have a much higher need for a, for ATP, right? Because they're doing a lot of work and that requires uh, ATP energy for the proteins in the muscle cells. So yeah, uh, when you're doing a short burst of exercise, um, you, you need higher levels of ATP, but you're not breathing hard, right? If it's a short burst of exercise. So the oxygen levels in your blood are normal. So you've got this high demand for ATP, extra ATP, but you only have normal oxygen levels in the blood. That means the oxygen levels in the blood are not enough to give you the ATP you need. And so that counts as an oxygen shortage, right? The, the oxygen levels in your blood are just not sufficient to give you the ATP that you need for these short bursts of, of exercise. And here's another example of what I'm talking about. Imagine a, a sprinter, you know, some uh, athletes uh, they're experts in the sprint, and so they just run super fast, but maybe only for 50 yards, 100 yards or so. And so that's an incredible uh, burst of intense exercise, but they generally don't do it for so long that they get out of breath or, or hardly out of breath. So again, it's a situation where the ATP demand in their muscles is incredibly high, but they're not breathing any more than normal, and so there's too little oxygen in the blood uh, for this high ATP demand, so they... they, they it's not sufficient to do aerobic respiration. So for the short bursts of exercise, the muscles have to switch over to, uh, to anaerobic respiration. Okay, um, now, um, so far I've talked about when you're doing, you know, uh, non-strenuous activities, you know, sitting, standing, chatting uh, with your friends, your cells are using aerobic respiration, but when you're doing a short burst of super intense exercise, like the sprinter you see here, uh, your cells, especially your muscle cells, switch over to anaerobic respiration. Well, let's talk about what about somewhere in the middle, sort of a medium level of exercise. Let's say that um, you go jogging, not at a super fast pace, it's just sort of a, a, a medium pace. Um, well, you know from experience that if you do that, uh, you know, what, what we call a sustained exercise where you just keep jogging for 5 or 10 or 15 minutes or whatever, um, that your breathing rate goes up, right? And the reason that your body starts increasing your breathing rate is your body's trying to get you back into aerobic respiration because you know when you started that was a short burst of exercise and so your muscle cells were temporarily having to do anaerobic respiration because you're not breathing hard yet but your body doesn't want you to stay in anaerobic respiration and so if you keep exercising if you keep jogging uh, your body starts uh, increasing your respiration rate to bring in extra oxygen in the blood so you can go back to being uh, using aerobic respiration. Now, now, why is your body wanting you to go back into aerobic respiration? Well, I, I guess I've talked about that a couple times already. It's, it's just wasteful of your glucoses if your body stays in anaerobic respiration because your body gets only two ATPs per glucose. Yeah, so if you, if you go jogging or do some sustained exercise, your body will make you breathe hard so you can go back into aerobic respiration. Now, incidentally, exercise like that where you, um, uh, you exercise for long enough so that you start breathing hard and, and then your heart rate goes up is called aerobic exercise. Yeah, so if you go jogging or, I don't know, rowing or playing soccer, something that makes you, you breathe hard but where you can sustain it, you know, for 5 or 10 or 15 or 30 minutes, that's called aerobic exercise. Now, 
despite the fact that they call it aerobic exercise, that's kind of a misnomer because it's actually a mixture of anaerobic and aerobic respiration. In other words, if, if you do an exercise for long enough so that you're breathing hard, your muscles are actually doing some aerobic respiration, but also some anaerobic respiration. And the, the intensity of the exercise is what sets how much of those your muscles are doing. If you do like a very slow paced jog, uh, your muscles are doing mostly aerobic respiration and very little anaerobic respiration. But if you do a faster jog, you know, kind of a, um, almost a sprint, then your muscles are doing mostly anaerobic respiration with very little aerobic respiration. Okay, let's finish up this section by doing a brief review and comparison of aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. All right, so the first thing we'll address is, is oxygen needed? So you tell me, is oxygen needed for cellular aerobic respiration? And is oxygen needed for cellular anaerobic respiration? And the answers are yes and no. Uh, cellular aerobic respiration requires oxygen. That's just part of the definition of cellular aerobic respiration. And cellular anaerobic respiration, the cells do not require oxygen. And so the next question is, what is the ATP yield? How many ATPs does the cell get per glucose if it uses aerobic respiration? And how many ATPs per glucose if the cell uses anaerobic respiration? And here are the answers. If the cell is using aerobic respiration, the cell gets to recharge 36 ATPs per glucose. And if the cell is use, using anaerobic respiration, the cell gets to recharge 2 ATPs per glucose. All right, the next question is, what does glucose get broken down into by each of these two types of respiration? And if the cell is using aerobic respiration, the glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide and water. And if the cell is using anaerobic respiration, the glucose is broken down into lactic acid. Now, I didn't put the number of these molecules, but um, if you look at the equation for cellular aerobic respiration, you'll see that each glucose gets broken down into six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. And if the cell is using anaerobic respiration, each glucose gets broken down into two molecules of lactic acid. And next, let's talk about, well, when do the cells use aerobic respiration and when do the cells use anaerobic respiration? Um, so your cells use aerobic respiration if you're doing any sort of, I said non-exercise, but maybe I should have said uh, non-exercise or at least uh, non-strenuous exercise. So things like sitting and sleeping and standing around, um, you know, any sort of non-strenuous uh, type of activities. Your cells, especially your muscle cells, switch over to anaerobic respiration during brief periods of intense exercise. Like if you do an exercise, a short burst of intense exercise, but not long enough to start breathing hard, then your muscle cells have switched over into anaerobic respiration. And remember why they're doing that. It's because um, there's not enough oxygen in your blood for them to do aerobic respiration when you're doing an intense exercise, but not breathing hard. And the last thing I want to mention is, well, what do you, what are you, uh, what are you using if you're using, if you're doing an aerobic exercise, which remember means an exercise where you sustain it long enough um, so that your breathing rate goes up and your heart rate goes up. Well, aerobic exercise uses both aerobic respiration and aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. When you're doing aerobic ex exercise, it's a combination uh, of the two. Well, one of the major concepts from this section uh, has been um, the role of oxygen in your body choosing whether it's going to do aerobic or anaerobic respiration. If the oxygen levels in your blood are high enough to do aerobic respiration, that's what your body does. But if the oxygen levels in the blood are low, your, um, your cells switch over to doing anaerobic respiration. But regardless of whether your um, cells are doing aerobic or anaerobic respiration, they still need glucose, right? Because glucose is the fuel molecule both for aerobic or anaerobic respiration. Well, so we're going to switch now. Instead of talking about, you know, whether the blood is normal level of oxygen or low level of oxygen, we're now going to talk about what happens when the blood gets low on glucose, not when the blood gets low on oxygen. Okay, so uh, yeah, the, the point here is that your cells definitely need 
uh, sufficient levels of glucose in the blood because the cells use the glucose as their fuel mo molecule, whether the cell is doing aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration. And yeah, so the question is, what happens if your blood sugar levels uh, get very low? So there's too little glucose in the blood for your cells to do any kind of respiration. What, what does the body do then? Well, let me first answer the question, why would your blood get very low in blood glucose levels? And it could be just as simply as not eating for a while. You know, maybe it's been several hours between your meals, and so your blood sugar levels just naturally start to get low as your cells are using the blood sugar. Or it could be so something more prolonged, like maybe due to circumstances you may, might not eat for several days. Starvation, that would certainly also lower your blood sugar levels. Well, so the cells need to keep getting in some sort of fuel molecule because if the cells took in no fuel molecules, they would have nothing to recharge their ATP, and so your cells would just die from lack of, uh, of energy for the proteins to keep doing the tasks that run the cell. Okay, so yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about now. What happens if, if the blood glucose levels uh, are not sufficient enough for your cells to make enough ATP? Well, then your body can do uh, two things. Your body can uh, put more glucose into the blood. You know, more blood glucose can be generated. Or the cells could start using uh, molecules other than glucose as their cellular uh, fuel molecule, or your body can do both. You know, it, it can find a way to raise up the, the blood glucose levels, and it could also have the cells start using alternative fuel molecules. So let's talk about the first. So you're, you're, this, the scenario here is that your blood sugar levels get very low. Maybe it's been hours or even days since your last meal. Uh, and so your body wants to find some way of raising the glucose levels in the blood. How can your body do that? Well, one way your body has of raising the blood glucose levels when they are low is a process called glycogenolysis. Okay, and here's what it involves. It involves the cells of the liver. Um, and here's a cartoon of, of, of a liver cell, that kind of brown oval right there. Um, one of the things that your liver cells do is they store glycogen. And remember glycogen. Glycogen is a polymer of glucose. Um, glycogen is just a way of storing glucoses by linking them all together. And yeah, that's one thing your, your liver cells do is they store glycogen inside themselves uh, as a way of storing the glucose. Well, if your body senses that your blood sugar levels are low, your blood glucose levels, levels are low, your liver cells will start doing something called glycogenolysis. Uh, which means breaking down their glycogen stores and one at a time putting those glucoses into the bloodstream. So notice this uh, glycogenolysis process that your liver cells do um, boosts up your blood sugar levels if your blood sugar levels are getting low because as you can see here, it's putting glucose into the bloodstream. And incidentally, incidentally the name glycogenolysis, lysis means splitting and glycogen means glycogen, that glucose polymer that we just saw. So it literally means uh, splitting apart the, the glycogen. Okay, so um, yes, that's one way your body can boost low blood sugar levels is by the liver cells doing glycogenolysis. Now, incidentally, liver cells are not the only cells that have glycogen inside them. Muscle cells also have large stores of glycogen inside them. But the thing is your muscle cells don't share that glycogen with your bloodstream. So your muscle cells don't use their glycogen to boost your low blood sugar levels. Uh, the, the muscle cells were, will use their glycogen only for their own energy needs. They don't share the glucoses of the glycogen uh, with the bloodstream. Only the, only the liver cells uh, use their glycogen to boost your blood sugar levels. Okay, yeah, so uh, one response to low blood sugar is to put more glucose into the blood by glycogenolysis. Um, there's a second strategy that your body can use to boost your blood sugar levels if your blood sugar gets low, um, and this is called gluconeogenesis, which means making new glucoses. So your body has the ability to construct new glucose molecules from fat molecules, from protein molecules, or from lactic acid molecules, which remember are the, uh, the, uh, the products of anaerobic respiration. Yeah, so if your blood sugar is getting low, your body can um, change fats into blood glucose or change proteins into blood glucose or change lactic acid into blood glucose. And that process is called gluconeogenesis. Um, 
gluco means glucose and neo means new and genesis means making so it literally means making new glucose molecules okay just to recap if your blood glucose levels are getting low your body can boost the blood glucose levels by glycogenolysis or by gluconeogenesis now let's say that uh, here we go so let's say that um, those two processes of adding more glucose to the blood are still not sufficient and so that there's just still not enough glucose in the blood for your cells to uh, make the amount of ATP that they need well your body has a second strategy then uh, the cells can start using non-glucose molecules as their fuel molecules now remember cells uh, glucose is their favorite fuel molecule for for cellular respiration but if for whatever reason they're not able to get enough glucose from the blood uh, then the cells can start to switch to use non-glucose uh, molecules as their fuel and what are some of these non-glucose molecules that cells can use well one example are fatty acids and um, when your blood sugar is low when your blood glucose is low um, those fatty acids in the blood are put into the blood by your adipocytes and so let's remember here that adipose tissue is fat tissue and the cells of fat tissue are adipocytes and inside each adipocyte cell is a big ball of triglycerides triglycerides remember are the uh, the name of fat molecules and so yeah when your adipose tissue senses that your blood glucose is very low the adipocytes will start breaking down their triglycerides and the, the the monomers of triglycerides are glycerol and fatty acids and so the adipocytes will start secreting those fatty acids you know from breaking down their triglycerides the uh, they secrete those fatty acids into the bloodstream and then your cells that are starving for glucose can take in those fatty acids and um, use those fatty acids as a fuel molecule for um, uh, for cellular respiration you know for making ATPs uh, here's another alternative fuel that your cells can use if they can't get enough glucose from the blood amino acids um, so remember that amino acids are the monomers of proteins and the tissue type in your body that's highest in proteins is muscle tissue so if um, your cells are starving for glucose your muscle tissue will break down some of its proteins into individual amino acids and secrete those amino acids into the blood and your cells can take in those amino acids as an alternative fuel molecule alternative to glucose um, and and you know do cellular respiration using those amino acids as the fuel molecule to make ATP for themselves like you see going on here and there's yet a third type of alternative fuel molecule that your cells can use if there's not enough glucose in the blood um, these other fuel mo molecules are called ketone bodies and to explain where the ketone bodies come from let me bring the liver back into this diagram uh, so if your adip if your adipose tissue senses that your uh, blood is very low on glucose remember what we said a few minutes ago your adipose tissue will start breaking down its stored triglyceride molecules and one of the monomers from breaking down uh, triglycerides are fatty acids and so those adipocytes are putting fatty acids into the bloodstream well your liver will intercept some of those fatty acids and break them down into some smaller molecules that are called ketone bodies in other words ketone bodies are, are come from breaking down fatty acids by the liver and the liver puts those ketone bodies into the bloodstream and then your cells can take in those ketone bodies as an alternative fuel molecule good uh, oh yeah so so why does the cell convert the fatty acids into ketone bodies why not just let the cells take in the fatty acids directly as an alternative fuel molecule well the ketone bodies are just smaller so they're easier for your cells to take in and easier for your cells um, to use as a fuel molecule than than the plain fatty acids are okay so just to recap what we've talked about so far if um, if uh, the blood glucose levels are still too low despite your body doing glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis to, to put more glucose into the blood if the blood glucose is still too low your cells start using alternative fuel molecules like fatty acids and amino acids and ketone bodies um, as yeah as alternative fuel molecules well let me recap some of the uh, ways we talked about that your cells deal with um, low levels of glucose in the blood 
Uh, so if glucose levels are high enough in the blood, then you know you get standard cellular aerobic respiration, which is diagrammed here. The, you know the glucose in normal cellular aerobic respiration, the, the glucose goes into the cell and then it goes through the glycolysis uh, metabolic pathway, uh, which breaks each glucose down into two pyruvate molecules. <coughs> Pardon me. Then the, the pyruvates go inside the mitochondria where they go inside the citric acid cycle. And then after the citric acid cycle, there's the electron transport system. And unfortunately, the, the electron transport system is not part of this diagram. Um, anyway, so this represents the, the normal cellular aerobic rep respiration pathway if, um, if the blood has enough glucose. If the blood starts running low on glucose, one way that the body can put more glucose into the blood, remember, is glycogenolysis, and that's where the cells of the liver start breaking down their glycogen, their stored polymer of glucose, into individual glucoses and put those glucoses into the bloodstream to boost the blood sugar levels. And it's not part of this diagram, but the, the body can also do um, uh, gluconeogenesis, is w which is where the body makes new glucose mole molecules from fats and, um, uh, and, and other molecules like proteins and lactate. Um, but if the glycogenolysis and the gluconeogenesis are not sufficient to um, give you enough blood glucose, then your cells can start using alternative fuel molecules. And uh, one of these is shown here. This is where your adipose tissue starts breaking down its triglycerides into the triglyceride monomers, fatty acids and glycerol. And you can see from this diagram, the fatty acids um, can be taken in by cells, and the fatty acids can be fed into the citric acid cycle. Um, the glycerol monomer uh, from the broken down uh, triglycerides uh, can be fed into the glycolysis metabolic pathway. Um, and it, remember that the liver can break down some of those fatty acids into smaller molecules called ketone bodies, which your cells can also use as an alternative fuel molecule. The ketone bodies feed into the citric acid cycle of the cell. Um, and remember that uh, your body can also use amino acids, or I should say your cells can also use amino acids as an alternative fuel molecule. And those are, uh, if your blood glucose level, levels are low, your muscle tissue starts breaking down its proteins into individual amino acids. Cells then take in those amino acids as fuel molecules. And, and some of these amino acids can uh, be changed into pyruvate and enter the uh, cellular aerobic respiration pathways pyruvate. Other of the amino acids can be fed directly into the um, citric acid cycle. Okay, so uh, that's uh, all we're going to say about how the body deals with um, low levels of glucose in the blood. Just a super quick summary. Uh, it either finds ways of putting more glucose into the blood, glycogenolysis or gluconeogenesis, and or the cells start using alternative fuel molecules like fatty acids and ketone bodies and amino acids. Okay, well, we're nearing the end of this lecture on um, cellular respiration. Um, if I had to summarize just the, the most important key points, it, it's this, that the point of cellular respiration is for your cells to use the energy and glucose to recharge their ATP supply. And the most usual way your cells do respiration is something called cellular aerobic respiration, which is what you see going on here, where the cells uh, take in glucose from the blood, but the cells also take in oxygen from the blood. And using the oxygen, the uh, uh, cells uh, break down the glucose into carbon dioxide and water, and that reaction uh, releases energy that the cell can use to recharge its ATP supply. Uh, the next slide shows the overall reaction for cellular aerobic respiration. For every one glucose the cells take in, they have to take in six molecules of oxygen from the blood. The oxygens react with those glucose, uh, with the glucose molecule to break down the glucose into six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. And for every one glucose that goes through this cellular aerobic respiration pathway, the cell is able to recharge 36 ATPs. Okay, well, that is the end of this lecture. Uh, I recommend that you do the review questions on this le lecture topic, and I will see you in the next lecture.